Good evening. Good evening. Is this working? No? It's just for the camera. All right. Good evening. Good evening. And thank you so much. This is a great turnout. We're happy to have you all here. Um, I'm Maris Saponchev, and I'm a member of this group that has its blue duct taped banner up, CNY Working for a Just Peace in Palestine and Israel. Um, and we uh, are delighted to have the honor to hear um, Mohammed uh, Katir tonight. Um, I know. He said it's not on. It's not on. It's not intended to be on. The microphone is just for the camera. There's not a PA system, so they have to speak loud and everyone has to be quiet. So Thank you. So our topic tonight is the Arab Spring and Islam. And this is something that we have been talking about in our, in our group for quite a while. Um, I want to read you, just because I had to write this down so I would remember, the definition of Arab Spring, literally the Arabic rebellions or Arab revolutions. And it says, since 18th of December 2010, so that's less than a year ago, there have been revolutions in Tunisia and Egypt, civil war in Libya, civil uprisings in Bahrain, Syria and Yemen, protests in Algeria, Iraq, Jordan, Morocco, and Oman, as well as on the borders of Israel, Palestine, minor protests in Kuwait, Lebanon, Mauritius, Saudi Arabia, Sudan, and the Western Sahara. So that, that's why I read down. That's a lot in um, an eight month period. Uh, one of the things that has been thrown around is the Muslim Brotherhood. And when you listen to certain commentators, it was often invoked as both exciting possibility, depending on who you talk to, or dangerous Muslims, terrorists, etc. And a conflation of sort of Islam with terrorism, uh, with danger. And so this is a really wonderful opportunity that we have tonight to sort of hear about the Muslim Brotherhood from Muhammad, who is well versed in it, and to really understand not just the issue, but also to be able to have a discussion about how the issue becomes conflated with other issues of <coughs> world policy, general fear, fear mongering, and, and Islamophobia. Um, so this is really a, an exciting opportunity. Muhammad was born in Egypt, came to Syracuse University as a graduate student, and he is now pursuing a PhD in Islamic studies. He works as a software consultant for financial institutions, and we have been friends for I don't know, a long time. A long time. And I am really honored that um, both uh, uh, Mohammed and, and Magda are people that I've worked with as a Jew doing work around building bridges and understanding one another better. So Mohammed's going to talk for a while, and then we're going to stop and have Q and A and pass the basket. So thank you very much. Welcome to Mohammed. Good evening. Good evening. Salaamu Alaikum. Wow. Well, some of you know it, or maybe <laughs> most of you know it. So I don't have even to explain it. That's good. Uh, I'm glad that all of you are here tonight. <coughs> As Mara said, there is a lot of talk. What happened between last year and still happening now is something that I personally or many people never have expected to be happening in the area, in the Middle East, that revolution started late last year, late last year, and it's still going on now for about, in the Arab countries, there is about 20, 20 Arab countries, and I actually read somewhere else the effect, the ripple effect of what happened in Egypt specifically has been heard in, in more than 50 to 60 countries around the world at different source, different levels. So what we wanted to see tonight, how things started, and where things are going, and is Islam really an enemy, or Islam is the, co the cause of what happened there, and where is the terrible Muslim Brotherhood are going, and what is this horrible Sharia thing that people are talking about, and that's going to take over the United States, and it's going to destroy everything, and will take over the Western world as we know it. So I will talk for a little bit, and then I would be happy to answer uh, your questions. What I would like to start with, you know that the revolution started in Tunisia in December. It started 
with the when somebody called Muhammad Boazizi, he put fire to his, he uh, lit himself on fire, and uh, he died a few days later. And people started to uh, to revolt against the regime that's there. It continued for about three weeks, and the president of Tunisia fled the country. That rippled into Egypt for started in January 25th, and the president of Egypt didn't flee the country, still there, but he resigned or left. I wanted to start from a video for a, a few minutes, how things started in Egypt. Things, things really in Egypt didn't start in December of last year. It's been going on for years and years and years. I wanted to just to start with a young lady that showed, that pushed people to go into the streets on January 25th. And I wanted you to see how things started. I'll show another video, another, a little bit also about five minutes, about how the revolution was there, then we'll have a discussion. So, Rose, can we have the first video, please? He's, a, he's part of the re revolution, too. <laughs> he started revolutions, many of them. المصريين ولعت نفسهم من الذل ومن الجوع ومن الفقر ومن البهدله اللي شايفينها بقالهم 30 سنه. اربع من المصريين ولعت نفسهم قالوا يمكن يحصل زي اللي حصل في تونس يمكن نبقى بلد حره بلد فيها عدل بلد فيها كرامه بلد الانسان فيها انسان بجد مش عايش كحيوان. النهارده واحد منهم مات واعلنوا موته. بقيت كل الناس واقفه بتقول لا حول ولا قوه الا بالله ده ما تكافر ده ما تعايش شهره يا جماعه حرام عليكم انا نزلت وكتبت ان انا بنت وهنزل ميدان التحرير وهقف لوحدي وهرفع يابطه يمكن الناس تحس وكتبت رقم يمكن الناس تنزل محدش نزل الا ثلاث شباب محدش نزل الا ثلاث شباب وثلاث عربيات امن مركزي وكان الباقي جاي في السكه وعشرات من البلطجيه وظباط وكانوا جايين بمنتهى الرعب فضلوا يتكلموا معانا بعدونا عن الناس يمكن بقى اسوء شويه بس اول لما انفردوا بينا قعدوا يقولوا لنا حرام عليكم كفايه احنا منكم احنا من الشعب الناس اللي ماتوا دول عندهم حاله نفسيه حاله نفسيه حرام بقى كفايه اللي بيحصل ده كفايه كل الـ كل الجرايد وكل حاجه تبع الحكومه اي حد بيموت من البهدله والقرف اللي احنا عايشين فيه يتقال ان هو مات كده علشان عنده اختلال ولا مشكله نفسيه، مشكله نفسيه روح عند مجلس الشعب. انا بس بصور لكم فيديو عشان اقول لكم رساله واحده. عايزين ننزل يوم 25 لو لسه عندنا كرامه ولسه عايزين نعيش كانسان وكبني ادمين في البلد دي لازم ننزل يوم 25. هننزل نطالب بحقنا، بحقنا كبني ادمين، مش هقول لكم حقنا كسياسيين ولا عايزين ولا عند الشعب ولا رئيس ولا اي زفت من الكلام ده كله، عايزين حقنا، مش عايزين اي حاجه ثانيه. الحكومة دي كلها بقت بايظة، رئيس فاسد والدنيا بايظة وأمن دولة بايظ. الناس دي خافوا من ما خافوش من الموت وخافوا من أمن الدولة، خافوا من الفساد. تخيلوا أنتوا برضه أنتوا كده هتموتوا نفسكم ولا أنتوا مش دارينين؟ أنا هنزل يوم 25 من دلوقتي لحد 25 هنزل أوزع بيان على كل واحد في الشارع ومش هولع في نفسي. لو الحكومة عايزة تولع فيا تيجي تولع وكل واحد في البلد دي شايف نفسه راجل يبقى ينزل ما كل واحد في البلد دي بيقول البنات اللي بتنزل مظاهرة بتتبهدل وما يصحش ان هي تنزل وحرام يخلي عنده نكوة ورجولة وينزل يوم 25 كل واحد بيقول العدد هيبقى نازل قليل وما فيش حاجة هتحصل عايز اقول له انت السبب اللي احنا فيه ايوه انت السبب وانت مدان زيك زي الريس زي اي فاسد زي اي ظابط بيضربنا وبيبهدلنا انت السبب 
نزولك معانا هيفرق ومش بيفرق حاجه بسيطه لا بيفرق كتير كلامك مع جيرانك ومع صحابك ومع زمايلك ومع اهلك وانك تشجعهم ان هم ينزلوا حتى لما بينزلوا في منطقه مش من بلد التحرير ولا قدام اللازوغلي ولا في اي حته بس تنزلوا تسجلوا موقف وتقولوا احنا بني ادمين ده بيفرق قاعدك في بيتك بتتفرج او بتشوف على الفيسبوك وبتطلع على الاخبار ده بيبهدلنا احنا بيبهدلنا انا لو انت عندك كرامه وانت انسان وراجل في البلد دي يبقى تنزل تنزل تحميني وتحمي اي بنت تنزل لو فضلت قاعد في البيت تبقى تستحق كل اللي بيجارك ومش انت لوحدك انت هتبقى مدان انت هتبقى مسؤول وانت اللي عليك ذنب كبير قوي ذنب البلد دي وذنب كل واحد عايش فيها انت هتبقى شايل مسؤوليه كل واحد نزل الشارع عشان يطالب بحقه وانت قاعد في بيتك انزل البيت ابعت مسجات لاصحابك اكتب على النت في كل حته وعي انت عارف الدايره بتاعتك عمارتك لوحدها واصحابك وقرايبك بس قول لهم انزل معايا نزلهم خمسه ولا عشره لو كل واحد فينا نزل خمسه ولا عشره ونزل بيهم لميدان التحرير او ميدان اللازوغلي او في اي حته عشوائيه حتى ويتكلم الناس ويقول لهم بقى كفايه بدل ما نولع في نفسنا تعالوا نتكلم ونسجل موقف ده هيفرق وهيفرق كتير قوي اوعى تقول مفيش امل طول ما انت بتقول مفيش امل هيبقى مفيش امل طول ما انت بتنزل وتسجل موقف هيبقى في امل اوعى تخاف الحكومه خاف من ربنا ربنا بيقول ان الله لا يغير ما بنفسا حتى بقوم حتى يغيروا ما بانفسهم ليه؟ ما مش عشان ان انت تبقى كويس وقاعد في حالك وماشي من بحيرتك، الحته هتقع عليك وهتقع علينا كلنا. انزل وطالب بحقك وبحقي وبحق اهلك وبحقنا كلنا. انا نازله من 25 وهقول للفساد لا والنظام لا. I don't know if you followed what she said. You followed the, the translation was good. Because if you, I know some of you understand the Arabic. The words that she said, that this young lady said, is very powerful. She was really, she's using words in Arabic, pushing people. You, if you're real men, and if you're real men, you get out and do this. And pushing the young men and, and the young people and everybody to get out on the 25th, on January 25th. This is... This is one of the people who did this. The, the, this revolution that started on January 25th had been brewing for a couple of years from before. And it just sparked with the Tunisian uh, overthrow of their dictator. What happened in Egypt after this, it's something I think many of you uh, have seen on TV. Uh, and some people told me they were glued to the TV as much as they could. To, f to follow what's been happening. It was really inspiring to see, and inspiring for me, lived in Egypt half my life or less than half, to, to see that the Egyptian people revolted in this way. It made me feel proud at, that they could do this. The implications of this and what happened, I wanted to show you also how just to, if you forgot what happened, just a few minutes also, and what happened when people got into the Tahrir Square, which became famous for, uh, for revolutions, when people make it synonymous with overthrowing people or revolting against a regime that's happening there. So if we can see the next few minutes also, then we'll continue with our discussion. <laughs>
هذه التظاهرات وما شهدناه قبلها من وقفات احتجاجية خلال الأعوام الخليلة الماضية ما كان لها أن تتم لولا المساحات العريضة لحرية الرأي والتعبير والصحافة وغيرها من الحريات التي أتاحتها خطوات الإصلاح لأبناء الشعب Can we stop here, Rose? Thank you. This is, I wanted to show you, this was the, the when you saw Hosni Mubarak there, that was his last, before, the one speech before last. He had one last speech after this, and no one ever heard from him again afterwards. And as you can see, what started is that people in the street, and it wasn't anything, this revolution wasn't started as this guy was saying, it wasn't a Muslim revolution, it was a Christian revolution, it was an atheist revolution, it's a revolution of the people. It's really people who were feeling what was happening in Egypt before then. It's lack of political participation. No one can get any, anything uh, unless if you are a member of the party and you have to go certain, up to a certain place. Freedom of speech. You can say whatever you want to say, but it's completely useless. It falls completely on deaf ears. You're not going to go anywhere. The poverty that there was rampant. The youth had no hope for future. They had no hope for future. Uh, the, the, I'm sorry, I had to keep the microphone, although you don't hear me, but he said I have to do that. Uh, the, the youth had no hope for future. The, uh, the, the poverty, the gap between the rich and poor was getting wider. So its people was mostly economic, suppression of freedom, of speech, that was really behind this revolution. And they were able, they started, one of the main things that you have seen, the, the police, the police in the first three or four days, one of the main things that people were complaining about or not suffering from actually is the poli police brutality. You've seen how the police cars were going and sometimes they over, they ran, overran some of the people, they let, they get them aside right or left. And there is a lot of things the police over the past, the, the few years, the past 20 years or so, the, the previous 20 years to that, people suffered a lot from uh, the police and the police apparatus and the different police agencies in the country. The army, when they got in, people welcomed the army with open arms because they thought that the, the army is the one, the only power that will really get rid of Mubarak, which is actually, that's what happened. That's what ended up happening, is that the army said to Mubarak, that's the end of it, because the, 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 he, he tried, he gave two speeches, and he tried to calm people down, and people just weren't listening. They just had enough, they were fed up, they weren't going to listen to any more of the things that he was saying. So, just to cut this, make it shorter, at the end, on February 11, Mubarak left the presidency to his appointed deputy, which a day or two after, a few days afterwards, anyway, no one ever heard back from him. So they both were put aside. A new government came in, and right now the, there is a, a government that, ha that was formed in March, and there were some changes also that happened last week. They changed some of the ministers. Just run quickly what happened after the revolution and where we where are we right now and where we're going after the revolution or during the revolution many of the parties that didn't get involved did get involved and they said that they were supporting the revolution and many the parties in Egypt were really marginalized there were one party the national democratic party and that's the only one that was in power so there were about another 10 parties or so, completely marginal. They have no representation in the parliament. <clears throat> the biggest bloc was the Muslim Brotherhood. And although they not, were not officially a party, but they had the organization on the ground. They had the people who were following what they were doing and what they were saying. 
And these were the only organization or the only uh, uh, group of organized party, sort of, that can reach the people and affect some changes. They started to come up and they came out and they said, many of these people, I'll go through this very quickly, a history of the, the Muslim Brotherhood and where is the Muslim Brotherhood. There are many people that now in the media here and all over the world that say the Muslim Brotherhood is going to take over and they're going to turn this country or the whole region into a terrorist, we're going to be a terrorist nation, theocratic country, and we're going to have another, instead of one Iran that we have now, we probably will have another 20, 30 Irans in the country, and what we're going to do, what will happen to the treaty with Israel, what will happen to Israel, all of these people are going to come around, all of these people will continue to send terrorists to the United States. To me, this is, there is nothing further from the truth more than that. I just also, this is the last video I'm going to show, and it was, I saw it, I'm sure many of you saw the um, people talking about the Muslim Brotherhood and the Sharia law and how it's going to take over. I'm going to show you one clip also, a few minutes, of one of these experts. There are many experts that come out now and they appoint themselves as experts. This particular expert teaches at, I think, Harvard and Stanford and London, so he ranks very way up there. But it's something that also it's important to see is that for after that, I will go through quickly the Brotherhood and the Sharia. So can we see the last video, Rose? during the crisis was uh, flip followed by flop, followed by flip. I mean, how many times did the president's position change? One minute uh, he wanted Mubarak out, the next he wanted him to be part of an orderly transition. There were at least four different people saying four different things. In fact, I came to the conclusion that the United States had two foreign policies running concurrently. If it was Monday, uh, it was Secretary Clinton's. If it was Tuesday, it was back to President right, Obama's. It was a, sh it was a shambles. Neil, a flip uh, followed by flop, followed by flip, uh, to use your words, seems to have worked, did it not? 
I said, well, I, I, I wish I shared your confidence. Uh, right now, we have a six-month period of military rule. Uh, right now, we have, as far as I can see, virtually no organization on the part of secular Democrats. The only organized opposition force in Egyptian politics right now is the Muslim Brotherhood. Now, if you uh, look closely at what the Muslim Brotherhood stands for, it is for the imposition and enforcement of Sharia law and the restoration of the caliphate. Anybody who could count this as a major breakthrough for United States foreign policy hasn't got a clue about what happens in the wake of a revolution like this. It is far too early to say that this is a triumph. On the contrary, the risks are extremely high that between now and the end of the year, the Muslim Brotherhood will get, get, get into power and then we will be staring at something comparable uh, in its magnitude to 1979 in Iran. President Obama is one of the least experienced men in terms of foreign policy ever to occupy the White House. And yet he has advisors around him who are, frankly, second if not third rate. And you just can't do that. It's far too risky. It's far too dangerous a world. And some of us said this when he ran for election, that it was a huge risk to put somebody with that kind of inexperience into a position like Commander-in-Chief of the United States. Think and I think what we're seeing unfold in Egypt reveals the truth of that statement. You think Secretary Gates, Secretary Clinton are second or third rate foreign policy uh, strategists? Well, to be perfectly honest, compared with the people that we've seen in the past, your guest tomorrow's Big Brzezinski or his predecessor Henry Kissinger, yes, I do not think they're in that league. Uh, last week I was in, uh, in Tel Aviv at the Herzliya Security Conference, and I have to tell you that the conversation uh, at that conference was one of dismay about the complete amateurishness of American policy. I do think that the President regards making touchy-feely speeches as a substitute for having a strategy, and I want to emphasize the risks that are currently being run in that region. If you look at history, and remember I'm a historian, most revolutions lead not to happy, clappy democracies, but to periods of internal turmoil, often to periods of terror, and they also lead to external aggression, because the simplest way to mobilize people in a relatively poor and not very well-educated country like Egypt is to point to the alleged enemy within, and then of course the enemy abroad. The scenarios that the Israelis are looking at involve a transition not to some kind of peaceful and amicable democracy, but to a Muslim Brotherhood dominated regime, which then pursues an aggressive policy towards Israel. This is not a zero probability scenario, this is a high probability scenario, and as far as I can see, the President isn't considering it. Okay, so I guess you saw, I don't know what you think of this guy, um, you don't have to say it out loud, but uh, it's, it's uh, of course you all have seen one or more here or there people talking in this way. I mean, this guy talks like, I know everything, you guys are nothing. And you listen to me, just listen to what I say. Uh, it, it, it's sad because this is how people's uh, mindset uh, are, are they, they give, they put some of these guys on different media outlets and they, this is how they shape the public opinion. And this is how they want you to think of the Muslim Brotherhood, of what the Muslim Brotherhood is, what Sharia is. I'm going to run through and there are many, many of the things I'm going to do. This is before uh, the, if you go back, rows one, uh, yeah, this is, that's fine. Let's, let's start from here. This is good. So this is, this is Egypt. This is, this is Egypt situated. Uh, it, it's, uh, this is Cairo here and this is the Nile. It goes, it goes down there. Uh, and if we, if we go to the next one, it's going to start to say, what is the Muslim Brotherhood? The way, the, the, just to run quickly through, if you go next, uh, Rose, through where is the Muslim Brotherhood and what historically where it started. It started, uh, Egypt were colonized by the British in 1982 up to 1922 and after that was Pure. The, after that, there was a sort of an agreement to be ruled by a monarchy that's in control in conjunction with the British rule. The Ottoman Caliphate ended after World War I, ended in 1924. Kemal Ataturk came to Turkey and abolished everything related to the Caliphate. Uh, the, the politics were uh, mostly have nationalists, and there is also between between the nationalists and the monarchy and the British, everyone wanted to get their own way. In, within this came the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood. His name, if you go to the next slide, and the next one, 
that's, that's the man who founded the Muslim Brotherhood. His name is Hassan al-Banna. And if we go through what he did and his life, he was born in 1906 in, in west of uh, Cairo, northwest of Cairo. And he studied, he had sort of regular students. He wasn't, he didn't go to any, um, uh, didn't go to the Azhar University or anything, go, went to regular education, regular public education. And he became a school teacher. Uh, he graduated in 1927 and uh, moved, worked in, uh, in another place, Ismailia, on the Suez Canal. He, the Muslim Brotherhood he was founded in 1928, and he came back to Cairo in 1932. He was, he was the head of the Muslim Brotherhood until he was actually assassinated in 1949. So that's uh, just a quick run through the history of the, the Brotherhood until he, um, until he, until he died. Okay, next slide, please. What his concerns were when he started the Muslim Brotherhood is the Islamic decline. The, after the Caliphate declined, uh, then he saw in, and the Western, Westerni westernization of Egypt. He wanted to keep Egypt as a Muslim country, as an Islamic-based country. And he wasn't really much concerned about the, the ulama or Al-Azhar University or the people in Al-Azhar. As a matter of fact, they always had some clashes, and they still do, by the way. The, uh, the Ikhwan Muslimin and Al-Azhar universities they don't see eye to eye all the time on issues because they're mostly concerned with the social justice issues rather than uh, uh, the theocratical issues. And he wanted to have the Islam as a comprehensive uh, system. Um, so what he wanted to do is to, it's basically what he wanted to have in mind. That the Muslim Brotherhood will be a social, will start and help social. And this is what the Muslim Brotherhood did during the time that he was there and still doing up until now, is to uh, work with the poor people and uh, to, to have the uh, work reach the poor, reach the orphans and go open hospitals and have spiritual, build Muslims or build people spiritually rather than indoctrinate them with the religious education. Go to the next one, please. And this is where generally, I'm going to skip this because there is always a conflict again between the, as I alluded to, uh, between the Muslim Brotherhood and the people in theocracy per se. It's next one. And this is basically the, the missions that the Muslim Brotherhood had in general, in general, as, as we can see. Uh, and they wanted, they were saying that Islam is the answer, as, as they're saying, it's Islam is the answer, which means that you will find many answers to the society ills if you go back to Islam, which we'll see, or to the Sharia, and what it says about this. And if we apply it properly, many of the things that are happening in the society, many of the ills of the society, will disappear. Just again, to run up until how we reach the Mubarak regime, the Hassan al-Banna was assassinated in 1949, after a few months after the war uh, with Israel in 1948 war. And the Muslim Brotherhood sent volunteers to Palestine to, to fight against the Israelis. There was internal strife and he was killed after that by the Egyptian government at the time. They supported Nasser in his 50, 1952 revolution. They had a fallout with him because he, Nasser was going one way through nationalism rather than concentrating on Egypt and Islam, Islamism and have Islam in, in the country. And he, they tried with a right or wrong. They were accused of trying to assassinate Nasser in 1954. And since then, he banned or since, since actually 1954 up until 
February, this past February, the Muslim Brotherhood is a banned organization in Egypt. They were doing things, but not under the name of the Muslim Brotherhood. Many of them were imprisoned, tortured. The torture of, at Nasser's time in the 50s and the 60s was very famous. Uh, one of the, uh, the ideologists of them, Said Qutb, was executed. And Said Qutb, he's one of the people who is credited, right or wrong, with the violence in, in the Muslim Brotherhood, in the violence that, uh, they, that happened in the Muslim Brotherhood. Some people uh, now, they, comp they, do, they say when they go back and analyze what he did, or his writings, they say he really, that wasn't the intent of what he wrote. We're fighting the aggression, fighting occupation, which is allowed in Islam. So he was seeing Nasser at the time that he was oppressing people and, and he was dominating. There is no, the same thing that we talk about now, no freedom of speech, no political participation. And he was trying to say, you can revolt against the ruler, which of course the dictators do not like this. <laughs> uh, so unfortunately he was, he, he was executed, he was tried in a military trial, and of course he's gonna be found guilty of revolting against the ruler, and he was executed in 1966. After his execution, and after the 1967 war, Egypt was transformed into a different state. So the concentration wasn't about trying to get rid of Nasser at the time, about to get rid of the aggression and the occupation of Israel when it occupied Sinai. So the people who were in charge of the Muslim Brotherhood after 1967, they decided to, that we're going to be peaceful, we will not get into any of the things that uh, w were done before, trying to overthrow rulers or dictators, and if everything that they will do, will do peacefully. And that's happened up until now, continued from the late 60s up until now. Uh, people credit, right or wrong, Said Qutb for the ideas of um, al-Zawahiri, uh, Ayman al-Zawahiri and bin Laden, Sometimes, some people refer to this as his writing. They can infer from his writing. But his writing, again, was against aggression and occupation. Sadat, when Sadat came, they got all the people who were imprisoned, they got them out of jail. He got them out of jail. But at the time, to fight, to fight the Marxism and, uh, and the people on the left in the country. So he was sort of using them also but they became powerful, which is the same thing. Sounds familiar to what happened in, in the 80s, in 1980s, that used the Afghanis, used Afghanistan to, to, to um, revolt against the Soviet occupation, and we supported them. But of course, we didn't continue with them. It's similar to what happened in Sadat. During the end of Sadat era, uh, they revolted against him, and they, he went back and put a lot of people in jail. And they continued in and out. When Mubarak came in 19, after the assassination of Sadat, they continued to be either in jail, in and out, and many of the people throughout the, 50, the last uh, 30 years or so in, of Mubarak's regime, many of them, many of them, the leadership of the Muslim Brotherhood were in and out of jail for years. So that's briefly what happened. Uh, for the life of the Muslim Brotherhood. Next slide, Rose. This continued up until the January 25th revolution. Uh, the, after the revolution, they formed a party. Of course, they were not allowed to have any party before. They were in the parliament, but they were in the parliament as independent. They, were never, they can never say that they are Muslim Brotherhood. They always, the TV and the media, they would say the banned organization. Some, some, they don't even want to say it, the name of the Muslim Brotherhood. They don't want to say it because it sounds, how can we say this? That's a dirty thing. So now they formed their own party. What they said is that they will contest right now uh, 40 to 50 percent of the parliament. They said flat out they will not be, they do not want to be a majority. And that's a smart thing to, to do. Anybody knows why? Because I would say, I don't care who pre 
what kind of president is coming, what kind of government is coming right now. It's a mess. You have a country that's been in shambles, not in shambles, but it's going in the wrong direction for a long period of time. To try to reverse this will not happen overnight. It will take years to reverse this. Anybody who's going to come to power now will take the brunt and will say, and this is what happened right now, is that over the past few months, people are saying, why things are not changing? Why things are not different? Why my life is not better? It's only we have it's been a few months. And some people magically think that now we have a revolution and we got rid of the dictator. I should, my salary should be doubled. And uh, all the youth who are on the street, they cannot find jobs. Now they should have jobs. So now there is a revolution. Uh, everything that was going wrong, all these people that who took our money, they're gonna, all the millions and billions of dollars who went out of the country should come back. And we know that this is going to be very difficult to happen. And anybody who studied history, revolutions take a long time to settle down, and things take a long time to, to change. So I think it's more than anything it's smart from them to say, we do not want to be the majority. So they're expected uh, to be in, in maybe probably they will be the, the party with the most seats in the parliament. They said they're not gonna offer a presidential candidate for the same reasons, I think, and they will make allies with other parties. They said flat out that they do not want to apply the Sharia per se in, in, in Egypt, not because it's bad, because there are many things. I think one of the things that I'm gonna do, I'm gonna read a few things. Uh, there was a, an interview with the leader of, one of the leaders of the, the Muslim Brotherhood, Isam al Aryan, with the Washington Post. And I, had a f I left a few copies of this here, whoever is interested. I'm going to read some excerpts from it. So it wouldn't be my words, uh, because when I read it, I said, that really, I hope that whoever this guy who was here before, or uh, whatever his name is from Harvard University, would, if he reads this, he will just understand that that's not true. It is not true at all. Let me try to read some of it. It says, what do you think of the killing of Osama bin Laden? It started, it was a few days after the killing of bin Laden. Uh, Osama al Riyan's answer, uh, he's now the deputy chairman of the Freedom and Justice Party. He said for us, Osama bin Laden never represented Islam. Islam is a peaceful religion. Violent groups are minority among Islamic groups. Even though it was war, it didn't give America the right to kill a person while the, fo while the forces could capture him. So the reporter asked him, so bin Laden shouldn't have been killed? To be brought to justice, this would have been better for America. America committed some mistakes. First, killing him instead of arresting him. Second, they violated the sovereignty of Pakistan. And the president, putting the president of Pakistan's government in a critical situation. Um, and another thing and about Mubarak, and he says, changes were brought by the Egyptians because for the last two centuries, this region has been under the interference from others outside. The reporter asked him, Mubarak didn't occupy the country. Yes, he was an Egyptian. This was an internal occupation. He was, who, support, who was supporting Mubarak? Not the army. The army got rid of him. The main support for Mubarak was from the US. This is the perception always in, in, in the region. Uh, that the U.S. supports the dictator for its own uh, interests, of course. There is a, a question that, what about America? Do you see good relations continuing with America? Of course, but America must respect the independence of Egypt. We started by talking about the violation of the sovereignty of Pakistan. We have no problems 
with the U.S. except that it supported Mubarak for 30 years continuously and without any alarm to stop his violation of human rights. The Egyptian people may have some bitterness in their chest about the American policy. America supported Saudi Arabia, which is a closed regime. A closed regime. They supported Saddam Hussein for a long time, and then they killed him. They supported the Iran, the Shah of Iran, and has been against and is against Iran today. He was uh, another excerpt because people, one of this guy also talked about what they're going to do to Israel and what's the relationship. Are they going to take Israel out? Or uh, one of the things that he said. We are not threatening Israel. Israel is hurting itself by its policies. It's discriminating inside Israel against Arabs. Israel is not under threat from Arabs. It's under threat from inside Israel, from its leaders like Netanyahu and Lieberman. It is under threat from the Israelis. I studied the Society of Israel. I know everything about this fight and the state. My dream is that we are not going to destroy Israel if it didn't revise its policy and it, its policy against Arabs and Jews, it can destroy itself. My dream is to live together as we did before the state of Israel. We lived in peace. We were never in conflict. Americans and Europeans exported the conflict created by Hitler to our land. The reporter asked him, you mean because there was a Holocaust? Yes, the Holocaust was a massacre against a race, against a religion. It's really a big crime. But we, never, we were never accused of it. Why do the Palestinians pay the price for the Nazis? Again, something about the America. Is every businessman going to be put out on trial, forced to leave the country? Please, America is a powerful country. It is a strong country. It's a shame for America to be afraid of Islam or Egyptian, or Egyptians, or democracy, or the will of the people, or the choice of the people. The America, which we know, is an America of values, not an America of troops, of arms. America that exports values to the whole world, not bombarding Afghanistan or Iraq. This is America which we respect, and the America that we want to live with. So these are a few words. This is from the man who leads the, the Freedom and Justice Party. So I don't know if anyone can see that this is a threat, or I'm sure if they read this, it wasn't the Washington Post, so I'm sure they, somebody read it. They say, oh, it's a ploy. It's something that they want to come to power, and they're going to be against, against the US and against the interest. They're going to twist everything. I don't know how we can win, except talking to you and we try to make sense from what's the nonsense that's being said and happening. I want to shift now to some of the things also that this Harvard professor talked about, the Sharia and the threat of the Sharia to, to America and the threat to the whole world. So if we go to the next. Yes, please. I'm going to try to, I'm going to skip a few things because, uh, because of time, but I will point to the main things that, and then I will, I will get your questions. A sharia is, is a way or a road. I'm going to let you read some of this rather than me reading this. You heard, you heard me read some of this stuff before. It's mostly a way or a law that was a point that God put through. The Sharia came in, for every religion. There was a Sharia. There was a Jewish Sharia, a Christian Sharia, and, uh, and, and a Muslim Sharia. If we go to the next one. Mm -hmm. 
rows left. Okay, let's next one. The authority of God, who put the Sharia and, and what's who has the authority to put the law? And we say who put the law? And it's it simply says God or Allah. It is he who has created the heavens and earth and everything in between. So the creator put this. It's as simple as that. All of these verses are from the Quran and this denotes where, where it is in the Quran. Next one. So he created heavens and earth and everything in between and he created man. So he knows and he's nearer to us, nearer to everyone than the jugular vein. We we'll always say this, that he's near to us than ourselves, than our own selves. So he knows what we're doing. There are two main things in the Sharia. In, in the Muslim law, it basically rests on two things. The relationship to God, how we can connect with him. And one of the verses that explains this I've only created invisible beings, the jinn and the human beings, so that they know me and worship me. And the word worship, it is not the ritual worship. Ritual worship is part of it. The praying, the fasting, the, that you know in every religion that we have to do is part of it. But this is not even the major part of it. This is the, takes part, I don't know, I can't say how much, but let's say one third of it, but the other part, is the next slide, is the relationship to others. Relationship to others in, in, the, in the family, in a community, in a society. How we can deal with one another and how we can build and have a good society, the moral of the, uh, the, the society. One verse that sums up how we can deal with one another, that God commands three things and forbids three things. This is a verse that sums up how we can deal with one another. Commands justice, the doing of good, and giving to one's relatives. Justice, no one has any problem with this, doing good. Actually, the verse or, or the word for, for good is not just good, it's al-ihsan in Arabic, which even do more than what you're expected to do. You always do for others, more than what you're expected, not just what you like done for yourself, which all we know, all know that, but you do more for others. Uh, and giving to relatives, not just the regular or relatives, giving to everybody and make everybody feel that they are human beings, that they're not less than you. You don't be rich and others are poor, so you, you give from your wealth. And there are three things that asks you to do, in general, not to do avoid the shameful things, the things that run counter to reason and aggression. And if you look at these three things, no one will say, okay, I mean, there is nothing wrong with that. We can understand it. If we go to the next slide, please. Uh, if you read this, it gives you one of the general rules of the Sharia. God wants you to have always told us, we're all going to die. Anybody has a problem with that? That we're not going to die? At some, oh, there is one here. Uh, <laughs> all right. Then you're excluded from this. <laughs> he said that you have to work for your, your life. And one of the things is stressed completely is the afterlife. So whatever you do, in this life, make sure that you're accountable to God and you're going to see God. I'll just show a couple of verses later on. And if you work for the afterlife, you'll be benefit in the afterlife and this life. Next one, please. I guess that's self-evident. Whatever, whatever you do is counted for you or against you. Anything you do. And this is, this is part of the Sharia. I wanna, w w think of this, is this threatening to America or to the Western lifestyle or anything? So maybe, maybe I'm missing something. And what's the threat? Yes. Could you back up to the three things that were um, 
Yes, please. Back up. Oh, you didn't hear him. Back up to the previous slide. Yes. Uh, um, no, I think before that. Before that. Um, when I first read that, um, the sentence that runs counter to reason and aggression, I read the counter as um, applying to aggression also. No, I'm sorry. That this is this the comma here, and this is the third thing. Right, I'm just saying that somebody read that though. They okay. That as a threatening, a threatening yes. Okay. One thing I want to make this clear: all of these are translations. Mm -hmm. uh, the Arabic, the Arabic uh, uh, text is the only text that we go to. If you look at this in different translation, translate completely in different way, different words put in a different different setup. So I'm sorry about that. This is one person's translation. And I also added a couple of things, my own. So maybe it's my mistake in, in trying to translate this. But that's a good thing, yes. So if we go back to the next one, next one, purposes of the Sharia. That's generally how people put the purposes. What's the goals? What do we want to reach? The preservation of the faith that you are looking at um, because now we're going to see we're going to see God at the end. So we want to make sure that the religion nothing goes counter to the religion. Uh, preservation of human life. Human life is sacred. Uh, family, society, money and wealth and uh, mind and intellect is. If anybody has a problem with any of these verses or anything, just let me know right away. Otherwise, <laughs> yes, you always have a problem because you don't, yeah, you're I'm not going to die. So you're I'm not going to die. So you're entitled to that. <laughs> Preservation of money and wealth. Yes. Out 